Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining me this morning, our analyst, Republican Ray Richardson and Democrat Ethan Strimling. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good to see you. Happy holidays. Yeah, Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's a tough holiday season, though, for so many people in the state after this last week's storm. At least four people died and hundreds of thousands lost power. Some are criticizing Governor Janet Mills for taking so long to publicly acknowledge the impacts, raising questions about if state officials were prepared. Here's what she had to say in a press conference she held Wednesday. Uh, we were in an emergency status. I mean, uh, we issued press releases. I was busy on the phone and on Zoom with these good people and others most of the day yesterday and much of the day Monday. I was in the office uh, doing, helping do the assessments that we're all talking about. Now, Ray, did you see the, the problem here that others did? No. In fact, um, if the audience is a Hallmark fan, they may understand this reference. This is a Gordinian Christmas miracle. I am not going to criticize Governor Mills. Um, the government, we looked to them to too much. I think they did what was appropriate. This was a terrible, terrible storm. And CMP crews were out. Everybody was working hard. I think sometimes we just want to criticize to criticize. And I don't think she did anything wrong. Ethan. Yeah, I think Ray's right on. I, you know, should she have come out? Could she have come out sooner and acknowledged it? Of course. you. Having your leader do that um, is important, but in this instance, she had state of emergency declared by Tuesday afternoon within 24 hours of this storm really starting. She was clearly doing the work that needed to be done. We'll see down the road, does she do a good job or not in making sure that people are taken care of? So far, the results are that she is doing a good job. So that's what matters much more. All right, on the national front, former President Donald Trump is taking heat for remarks he made at a rally in New Hampshire. Poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. About immigrants, as he as you heard there, Trump said they are, quote, poisoning the blood of our country, which many quickly compared to Hitler and Nazi slogans of World War II. Even GOP candidate Ron DeSantis saying this week that language, quote, doesn't help move the ball forward for Republicans. Ethan, obviously, this comes at a time when anti-Semitism is becoming all too common. Yeah, I, you know, it's really unfortunate. He, he used the term vermin before that, which is also a reference to Mein Kampf. This, these are additional references. When you look at Hitler's words, they're, they're almost identical in the words that he's using. Uh, and instead of trying to find a way to find solutions, which is what we need to do around all of this, he's not embracing one of the most important things about America, our immigrant history, how immigrants have built our country generation after generation. Right? Yeah, I agree. I thought it was a very terrible thing that he said because there's no way that can be heard even if he meant it in the best possible way. There's no way it's going to be heard that way. We all know the history of that language. He was referring to illegal immigration. I think most of America has woken up to the fact we have a problem there, that our southern border is porous. But you don't advance ideas talking about poisoning of the blood. That's just language that should not be in America. That's not who we are. There is no blood purity here. And speaking of immigration, the southern border is seeing a surge of migrants right now, as many as 12,000 people a day crossing from Mexico. It comes as Republicans in Congress are holding up aid to Ukraine and Israel until Democrats agree to a deal on tougher border and immigration policies. This week, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signing a controversial new law allowing state and local authorities to arrest undocumented immigrants and even deport them. We anticipate uh, with SB4 uh, that cracks down on illegal entry. That, that should reduce the number of people coming across the border. But the problem is far more than just numbers. It's also a national security crisis. Ray, the Biden administration is calling this law extreme. Do you agree? No, I don't agree. In fact, I was talking with Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire Wednesday, I think it was. He's had to take extraordinary measures up on the northern border. Federal government's not doing its job. We haven't had immigration reform in this country since 1986. There is a problem. This is a welcoming nation. We take in a million legal immigrants a year. But when you have people coming across the border in the manner in which we did, Texas can't take care of it. And when you have sanctuary cities around the country who, before this crisis, said they were welcoming, and if you send five or 10,000 people, they freak out. We all have a problem here. I, I mean, Governor Abbott's doing what he thinks is best for Texas. That's his job. Ethan. Oh, well, it's unconstitutional, right? I mean, immigration is federal policy. Is. You would agree with that. So sure. what he's doing, of course, is both inappropriate, inhumane, and unconstitutional. You know, it feels like every time we have this conversation, it's so important to remind everybody that the folks who are coming across the border may be dead if we send them back home. Right? They're coming from extreme poverty. They're coming from repressive regimes. They're trying to build a new life. 
And that's what's built America, as I said before, for generations, whether it was Jews or Catholics or whether it was Chinese immigrants or Vietnamese or Sudanese or Senegalese. We have built this country. And for a party to be spending so much time trying to stop the people who can build our country further, it's just sad. But even the Biden administration is saying they're in touch with uh, Mexico leaders uh, in, in agreeing that there needs to be stronger protections at the border. Sure. I mean, we, we all want to try to find better solutions to this, but we've just heard how Donald Trump and how some elected leaders are trying to find these answers that just stop things. If Republicans want a solution, there's negotiations going on in the U.S. Senate, right? They have not yet offered any ideas on how we can actually work with this to make sure that immigrants can come here, which is what we want and make sure they're vetted. Yeah, Ronald Reagan talked about the shining city on the hill, and one of the things he said was, if that city must have walls, then we're gonna have great big doors that are open to anyone who wants to come here and embrace us. I'm not denying that these people are fleeing oppression. They, most of them are. We know we've had some bad folks come across, people on a terror watch list. But this isn't the way to do it. They're coming into the country illegally. They're hiding in the shadows. It's no way for them to live. And we don't have the resources right now. We're doing nothing to create resources in the state or around the country to, for these people to come in. They're living in squalor. If they're making money, they're making it under the table. They're being paid subpar wages. They're being exploited. We used to be against the exploitation of people, but it seems now we are. We're for it. And finally, Pope Francis has announced a major policy shift in the Catholic Church in an attempt to be more inclusive, essentially saying Catholic priests can bless same-sex couples, stopping short of marriage. Ray, what do you think of this move? Well, for me, marriage for me is a faith-based institution. It comes from the Bible. That's what I believe about marriage. I don't want to see anybody mistreated. In this nation, everyone should be treated equally under the law. I'm not Catholic, but the Pope is supposed to be the ambassador of Christ and the ambassador of the Bible. This goes against what the Bible says. I think it's a bad move on his part. You can't water down the Word of God, no matter how much you want to be kind. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, the Bible's very clear about marriage being one man, one woman in communion with Christ. I don't think he's talking about marriage here. He's Ethan? blessing same-sex couples. The next yeah, step I, is I, marriage. All right. You know, uh, it's uh, unfortunate. I, I'm certainly glad that he's stepping forward and saying that we should acknowledge same-sex couples in the way that he is, but it doesn't go far enough, right? It doesn't get to the place of equality that we need to get to. Uh, you know, I'm more concerned about governments that don't do this. Orthodox religions, unfortunately, all of them mine, uh, are discriminatory against all kinds of groups, certainly the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I'm glad he's taken this step, um, uh, but it's not far enough, and hopefully, uh, ultimately, we can get there, and um, more people in the world can start to recognize that who you love is what matters, not your interpretation of the Bible and how you might impose that on other people. Yeah, and again, I want to be clear, this was a faith-based leader taking this stand. We're not talking about the government doing. The government should treat everyone equally under the law. I've always said that, I've always believed that, but this is a faith-based leader, and when a faith-based leader goes against what the Bible says, it makes no sense to me. The reality is, though, that his words have influence across our globe and, yeah, and sure. an influence on the decisions political leaders are making. Yeah. We're going to leave it there. We're going to take a quick break. The Weekend Morning Report is back right after this. Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining me once again this morning, our analysts, Republican Ray Richardson and Democrat Ethan Strimling. Hard to believe Christmas is here. Huh? I know. It's 24 <laughs> hours. Exciting. Though. Yeah. I want to start on a serious note, though. My sit-down interview with Governor Janet Mills this week on the Lewiston tragedy. We talked about everything from how it impacted her personally to the ongoing investigation and guns. I specifically asked her if Maine's yellow flag law failed, which she wouldn't say, but I did ask if she had changed her stance on stronger gun laws. Take a listen. Look, nobody goes through a, a situation like this, an episode like this, without wondering, could we do something different? Could we do something better to make sure that people in Maine are safe and that they feel safe? Would you support an assault weapons ban? I'm gonna look at every, pos every option uh, to think about how it will, how it will be, how it could be used in Maine, if at all. Are you looking to personally introduce any legislation in this next legislative session? 
Well, that's one thing I'm thinking about uh, every day, very carefully, and looking at what's on the books now, federal law, state law, what have other states done? Uh, what have they done that's worked? What have they done that hasn't worked? There are a lot of variations uh, on these themes, and I want to make sure we, what we do is Maine-grown. It's right for the state of Maine. Ethan, do you think the governor should be taking a stronger stance here? Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, just incredibly disappointing and, uh, you know, great appreciation for you for asking those kind of tough, clear questions. Uh, you know, when Connecticut happened, Sandy Hook happened, Governor Malloy at that time, um, within four months, had passed a broad range of legislation. We are now today about two months after what happened, and Janet Mills has proposed nothing. We already know what works. We know assault weapons bans works. We know that background checks works. We know red flag laws work. We know that waiting periods work. There is no more need for study. Over 40 people this year have been shot in mass shootings. Not simply Lewiston, remember. Westbrook, Yarmouth, 40 people shot. It's time for the governor to take a lead on this and propose serious legislation as soon as the new year starts. Right. Yeah. I'm. I'm going to disagree with my friend Ethan on that. I'm not certain that those things are going to work. We, I mean, we see this happen all over the country all the time. What I'm hoping happens, and I've said this repeatedly to everybody on both sides of this, let's wait until Chief Justice John, former Chief Justice John Wathen has completed what he's doing. We need some answers. Why in the world was Mr. Card released from the mental health facility in New York? We still don't have clear answers on that. There's a whole lot of stuff. What we usually do in America is knee-jerk everything because it's politically advantageous. Man, this is going to be twice now in the same morning. Um, I'm glad the governor's taking a cautious approach here. Maine's a unique place. We need answers, and then we craft uh, solutions once we have answers. There's a lot of unanswered questions here. But, Ray, we've seen in other states where this has happened. Connecticut, I brought up that example. They have half the per death uh, gun rate that we have per capita gun rate death that we have in Maine. So but, we are double what Connecticut is because but most of they have these strong suicides. So well, that's the that. same all over the country, and there's suicides with guns. But most of our and deaths here. I mean, I'm just saying the problem but, isn't the same in other. But places. a suicide is still no, a no, no, suicide I, is I, a I, gun I, death. And here, I, let me just try I'm to be clear about that. But let me be clear about one piece of it. Right, gun deaths that happen by suicide should be prevented as well. I agree. And when you have waiting periods, that prevents them. When you have background checks, that prevents them. You need to prevent assault weapons deaths through assault weapon bans. You have to look at the whole picture. We know what works in other states. Maine, again, in the Northeast, twice as many people killed by guns per capita as any other state. We can't wait any longer. What is a Maine-based approach here, though, Ray, as well, the governor said? I think a lot of things. First of all, the yellow flag law we have in place, people are saying it failed. Um, did it fail? I mean, did or was the law applied as it currently is written? I just think we need answers here. I mean, the day after this happened, I found out about it at 7.05 on Wednesday night. We were out at a nightclub. I got a text, and so I was up most of the night. The next morning on my program, people were losing their minds over all of this stuff. Instead of being worried about the victims, they were fighting over politics, and that's what we do here. I think we should get answers and figure out exactly what happened, going back to the New York mental health facility, and then look at what may be p potential solutions. All and right. until we do it, we're just, you know, throwing mud against the wall. All right, turning to 2024, the race for the White House. Former President Donald Trump has been disqualified from Colorado's 2024 primary ballot by the state Supreme Court. The court declared that Trump is ineligible for the White House under the U.S. Constitution's insurrection clause after January 6th. This is the first time in U.S. history that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment has been used to disqualify a presidential candidate. Here's what Colorado's Secretary of State had to say about it. Frankly, this case is only here because Trump's actions himself. He is the person who has led to this decision that he is disqualified because he tried to steal the presidency from the American people. Now, the court put its decision on hold until January 4th to allow for further appeals. The Trump campaign called the decision in Colorado, quote, completely flawed and is vowing to appeal to the Supreme Court. Ray, this could be a big deal for Trump, of course, especially given the efforts here in Maine. Yeah, I, I think it was terrible what they did. It was a 4-3 decision in Colorado. What the Colorado Supreme Court essentially did is something we don't believe in in this country. They were judge, jury, and executioner, except the person they went after was never charged with a crime. 
I mean, Jack Smith would charge him uh, with eating a ham sandwich if he could get away with it. He's a very serious prosecutor. He didn't charge him with insurrection. He's not been tried for insurrection. He's not been convicted of insurrection, but they've executed him on insurrection in terms of his political life. I think it's going to be overturned when the Washington Post, which can't stand this man, says this was a terrible decision. People ought to pay attention to that. And I want to be very transparent here. Ethan, you are behind the efforts here to get um, Trump off of the main ballot. Uh, the Secretary of State is set to announce her decision next week. Uh, you really think this is going to happen? Um, well, I don't know what uh, Secretary Bellows is going to do. Obviously, the Colorado decision was monumental. They made the right decision. Uh, look, it, it, everybody, you just have to look at it to know that he committed insurrection. And Ray, uh, just to correct one point, he has now, by two courts, been found gu guilty of insurrection. Two courts have now said, yes, he committed insurrection, he incited the riot, and the second court then also applied the 14th Amendment. I think Secretary Bellows has the authority. Uh, you know, there are qualifications to run for president. This, we have them. You have to be 35 years old. You can't have served two terms already. You have to be a naturally born citizen. And, oh, by the way, you have to have not committed insurrection against your country. So courts all the time, Secretary of State's all the time, are deciding who can or cannot be on the ballot. I'm hopeful that um, Secretary Bellows will look at what Colorado did and recognize that we have to take this action, otherwise our Constitution, the 14th Amendment, is meaningless. Right. Well, and to be fair, Ethan, two judges gave their opinion. Trump's not been tried for insurrection, so you can't convict him of it. But here's the other piece of this, is that it was a riot. It wasn't insurrection. If it was an insurrection, it was the dumbest damn insurrection in world history. It was a riot at the Capitol. And whether you can hold him accountable for it, the FBI said in January of 2022, there was no evidence that he organized it, strategized it, funded or any of it. So I think if you're gonna pull somebody off the ballot, you've at least got to charge them with a crime and try them and let their side come out. And there, you know, the 14th Amendment does talk about this, but it also says Congress may remove the disability, which means Congress has to impose the disability. No, it does not. It says Well, that's Congress what Douglas said in the abortion case, that if you have a right a to procreate, the then you also conversely have a right not to procreate. It works both ways. So let me just be clear about what happened back in the 1860s when this was passed. It was very clear at that time that no Confederates had to be convicted of anything. If you were a Confederate and you were found as such in a civil trial, as Donald Trump has just been found in terms of being an insurrectionist, you were not allowed to be seated uh, into any seat that you might run for. So there is nothing in there that says you have to be convicted. But again, two courts have now looked at the evidence, not had an opinion like you and I have on TV, looked at the evidence and said, yes, he is an insurrectionist. So either we believe in our court of law or we don't. All right, I think the voters it. should decide. We're going to leave it there. Meanwhile, Nikki Haley gaining ground on Trump in New Hampshire. According to a new St. Anselm College survey, Haley has doubled her support in the Granite State. The former U.N. ambassador now sits at 30% support, up from 15 in September. Former President Trump remains the front runner, though, still at 44% support of Republican likely New Hampshire primary voters. Ethan, we don't put a ton of weight in these polls these days, but if that's legit, this is a big deal um, following her endorsement, of course, from Governor Sununu. Yeah, look, it's a big deal in the sense that she's probably going to come in second in Iowa. I, I predict actually she will win New Hampshire, but then she's going to lose Nevada. She might do OK in South Carolina, maybe, and then it's all going to fall apart, right? This is the same kind of thing that John McCain might have had. You know, you have somebody who rises up like this, and then, of course, everything falls apart. Donald Trump has the full support of the party, has all of the money, et cetera. She just doesn't have the resources. New Hampshire likes to be quirky. We know that. They like to sort of throw their weight behind somebody they don't sometimes, and then that person often flames out in the end. So um, uh, it's fun to watch, but I don't think it's going to last very long. Right. I mean, it's not surprising she's risen in the New Hampshire polls. Chris Sununu won with, I think, 68% of the vote. He's a very popular governor there. They begged him to run again, and he chose not to. We'll see. I said uh, earlier this week, if she's within three or four points in New Hampshire on primary day, January 23rd, I think she gets some momentum. I think she'll get some money coming in. People say there might be a crack in, in Trump's wall. Um, I think Trump's got the nomination, barring something we don't know about. But the media likes to make this fun, and this is going to make it fun. All right. Speaking of fun, I want to wrap things up a little differently this week. Instead of winners and losers, we're going to do naughty or nice, starting with some holiday-themed things. Okay. So I want to start with re-gifting. Naughty or nice, Ray? Naughty. 
Oh, nice. No problem. <laughs> you get a gift that you think might be great for somebody else that you don't mm -hmm. want. What's wrong with? I guess I can't re-gift a Ray this year. All right. <laughs> Waiting until Christmas Eve to do your shopping, Ethan. Uh, that, I hope that's nice because I do it almost every year. So. <laughs> <laughs> you guilty too? No, no. For the first year in our 30, first time in our 38 year marriage, we had al almost everything done by November 30th. Normally, we're in the last November week. November okay. 30th? Yeah, well, we had a wow, We wow. went to a lot of parties. We <laughs> yes, saw some of them. All right, yeah, so we'll, we'll check the nice box yeah. there. All right. Finally, uh, the most important question talking politics at the holiday table, Ray. You know, I, I mean, I just don't think everything has to be about politics, and that's what I do for a living. No, no, be happy. <laughs> no, be happy. <laughs> At my family's table, you have to talk politics. It's kind of what we do, so I would say that's definitely nice, but I have been at some holiday tables where that would be a very bad idea. All right, that's going to do it for us here on Political Brew. Thanks for joining us. Thank a you. quick note, we will not be here next weekend ahead of the new year. So from all of us at New Center Maine, have a safe and happy holiday. The Morning Report is back right after this.